Good morning, saints. If we have not met, my name is TJ Lucas, and I'm a member here at King's Cross, and it is my uh, privilege to get to share the word with you this morning uh, in the absence of Pastor Nick. And so if you would please uh, turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 20. Very helpful tip. Um, 2 Corinthians is right after 1 Corinthians, which is right after Romans, which is right after Acts. So if you find Acts, just go forward a bit. <laughs> uh, so we will read the passage together. It is a, a longer passage this morning. We're going to read all the way to chapter 7, verse 1. But I think that it will make sense as one large unit. Uh, Altogether. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 20. I do apologize if I sound a little nasally. I'm getting over a slight cold. Beginning at verse 20. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has, has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Let's pray together. Father, there is much here in the text. You have spoken to us, and we recognize the gravity of that reality, that these are the words of our Creator, our Savior, our Lord, our God. And so we ask that today you would illuminate the text before our eyes, even though there's no way we will hit every detail of this text. We do ask that you would give us clarity about what you are speaking to us, that as we uh, look to a world around us that is uh, in many ways hostile to your gospel message, the gospel of reconciliation, we pray that you would give us wisdom and clarity and discernment of how we can be ambassadors of reconciliation to a world that is uh, dark and in need of salvation. We thank you that you have spoken to us 
We ask that you would provide clarity this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. So our title this morning, you may have noticed in the uh, bulletin, not the word for it, uh, is Gospel Ministry in a Negative World. And I get that term, negative world, from uh, a, an author who is a Christian author uh, right now, and he, he's come up with this terminology of positive world, neutral world, and negative world. And the, the purpose of this terminology, it's not, it almost sounds a little science fiction-y. He calls it the three worlds theory. It sounds like he's writing science fiction. But really, it's just meant to describe uh, the culture in which we find ourselves as Christians today, as opposed to perhaps the culture that our, our grandparents or our great-grandparents may have found themselves in as Christians in uh, the United States. And so he describes each of these three worlds, and his thesis is that we currently find ourselves in the last of the three, which he calls negative world. And I, I would say, if we're not there yet, I'll, I'll describe it for you momentarily, I would say, if we're not there yet, we are probably moving in that direction relatively quickly. And so uh, I'll read these descriptions. They're a little bit long, but I think they are helpful for uh, setting some stage here. So he describes positive world. This is Aaron Wren. Uh, he describes positive world as this. A society at large retains a mostly positive view of Christianity. To be known as a good church-going man remains part of being an upstanding citizen. Publicly, being a Christian is a status enhancer. Christian moral norms are the basic norms of society, and violating them can bring negative consequences. That is how he describes positive world, and I think we might still find pockets of that around us, uh, but I do think he is right to assert that that is probably not the normal experience of Christians, maybe particularly here in the Pacific Northwest. A neutral world, he describes this, this transitionary world, and he describes it this way. He says, society takes a neutral stance toward Christianity. Christianity no longer has privileged status, but is not disfavored either. Being publicly known as a Christian has neither positive nor negative impact on one's social status. Christianity is a valid option within a pluralistic public square. Christian moral norms retain some residual effect. I think, I think you could make an argument, perhaps, that we might find ourselves in that location still, or that there's, there's remnants of that reality around us. But I do think his description of negative world, for many of us, as we go out into uh, the secular society around us to our jobs, I think negative world might most closely describe what we experience. And he describes a negative world this way. He says, society has come to have a negative view of Christianity. Being known as a Christian is a social negative, particularly in the elite domains of society. Christian morality is expressly repudiated and seen as a threat to the public good and the new public moral order. Subscribing to Christian moral views or violating the secular moral order brings negative consequences. So what Wren is arguing is that we are there for the most part. We have, we have uh, transitioned as a society from one that basically took Christianity for granted, basically understood the moral norms of Christianity to be normative for the world at large and that we should all basically agree with them, to now a, a place where if you simply go out and state Christian moral teachings as though they are simple fact, you're likely to, to receive some pushback. Uh, and perhaps people will make assumptions about you that are not fair uh, simply because you state these moral teachings of Christianity. You might ask, what does this have to do with the text that we're actually talking about this morning? Well, I would argue, and I, I don't think there's, there's a lot of argument to be made in opposition to the claim I'm about to make. I think Paul was in negative world. Uh, when, when Paul began his ministry shortly, or sometime after the death of Christ, Paul is sort of added to this team of apostles to go out and to proclaim the gospel of reconciliation to the world. I think that Paul was ministering in, in what we might call negative world. Uh, I don't think we require a lot more evidence for that claim than to simply say uh, Christ was killed. All of Christ's spokesmen his original uh, ambassadors of the gospel were killed, uh, persecuted. Many of the leaders of the early church were killed. And what I think is fascinating is that the early church, which was brought into existence in that sort of environment, 
was able somehow over the course of a couple centuries to turn negative world into positive world. And I think that the text that we are examining this morning gives us some of the insight into how was it, how was it, of course, by the grace of God, but what were the tactics of the early church that enabled them to transform negative world, a world that was largely opposed to Christianity, into a thousand years of Christendom, where Christianity was sort of assumed as the, the norm, that, that the moral teachings of Christianity were broadly accepted. We knew uh, abortion was evil and, and homosexuality was evil and these different sorts of things just kind of became a general assumption. How did we transition from the world that was utterly opposed to that into a world that broadly accepted that? And I think that uh, Paul lays out for us in this text some of the key methods, the mindsets that helped early Christians to change the world in that way. And so in today's passage, I think Paul is going to lay out for us uh, the characteristics of gospel proclamation in a negative world. And we understand all of this is by God's grace. There's no tactic that we can simply employ and expect to see the world change simply because we had the right formula. All of this is God working through his people. But I think if we uh, look to the pattern as Paul tells us to follow the pattern that you see in us in Philippians chapter three. If we look to that pattern that Paul lays out, that Jesus, of course, laid out, Jesus is the, the ultimate example of everything that we're going to see in these passages. Uh, if we look to those and, and desire to follow those examples, I think that we can trust that God will bear fruit through us as well. So uh, three points this morning. Number one is simply the task itself. The, the proclamation of reconciliation. That is the task that we've been given. But number two, the second point, is three ingredients for the ministry of reconciliation. We have been called to minister reconciliation to the world, and I think that this passage, at the very least, lays out three uh, ingredients for how we ought to do that. And number three, the third point, is the attitude of the ambassadors. So let us go back to the beginning of our passage this morning and, and simply see the task. What is the task that we have been given as ministers or ambassadors for Christ? Beginning at verse 20, we're just going to read up to chapter 6, verse 2. Paul says this, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So, there's a lot there that we could analyze and take time to discuss, but I think we're going to jump right to uh, the end of verse 20, where we see the task that Paul understands his role to be, and I think that we have a very similar role, even though we may not have the same position that Paul had as apostles, I think we have a similar role in the world around us, which is this task uh, as ambassadors for God who proclaim, be reconciled to God. We go into the world around us with this message, a message of reconciliation. And there's an implication there. If we are going into the world and saying, world, what you need is reconciliation. That implies before uh, reconciliation can be needed, that there is currently conflict. That there is a sense of enmity between God and the world. That, that God looks upon fallen man, and sees fallen man as his enemy. And therefore, reconciliation is what is required. We would have no ministry of reconciliation if it were not for the fact that the world currently stands as enemies of God. And I think that in, in a world that has the sort of current anthropology, that is the doctrine of man, if you were to go out into the world and simply ask, what do you think is true of mankind? I think it's actually pretty unlikely that you would find people who uh, tell you what the Bible says about mankind. 
uh, the, the scriptural view of man fallen in Adam is actually quite bleak. It, it is not a pretty picture when we think about who and what fallen man is. The, the anthropology of the world around us is bright and shiny. Man is good. Most people are pretty much good people. And we desire truly what is good. We fail here and there. But for the most part, we, we are good. In fact, sadly, uh, this happens to be what most evangelical Christians believe as well. There's a, a popular survey. You may have heard of it if you've heard of uh, R.C. Sproul. His ministry is called, or he has passed on into glory, but he has a ministry or had one called uh, Ligonier Ministries. And they do, every two years, a survey. And in that survey, they, they pose, uh, I think it's like 30-something uh, statements. And the people who take the survey, they identify their, you know, sort of religious leanings. And then they identify for each statement their level of agreement or disagreement with the statement. And there are two statements in this particular survey that I think are particularly uh, helpful for us in setting some context for the present view of man in our world. So uh, listen to this, 65% of American evangelicals, these are people who identify themselves as Christians, as evangelicals, 65% of us believe that all people are born innocent. And not only that, 55% of American evangelicals also agreed that everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. This does not align with, with the scriptural witness to fallen mankind. Scripture describes fallen man as no one does what is good. No one seeks God. We are constantly seeking that which is evil. But with beliefs like those that most people are, or that people are generally good, everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature, it is no wonder that this gospel message of reconciliation to God doesn't make sense. If we do not understand man to be God's fallen man, to be God's enemy, then a message of reconciliation does not make any sense in our world. And so I think that before we can even begin to consider the task that God has laid before us, this ministry, this ambassadorship of, of reconciliation, we must first get right our doctrine of mankind. Fallen man is neither God's friend nor God's child. And if we go into the world thinking these people are all God's friends and they're all God's children, then we will not properly present the gospel of reconciliation. Fallen man is a child of wrath and sits under the just judgment of God. And therefore, the only hope for him is reconciliation. But there is great hope for that. Why? Well, verse 21 tells us, for our sake, he, that is God the Father, made him, that is God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin, so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. For the purpose of this reconciliation, Christ came down. And I think it's so interesting that it doesn't simply say, you know, he took on your sin, or he bore your sin, but it says that he became sin so that you could become the righteousness of God. This is, I think, the most succinct summary of how the gospel saves. It can be found anywhere in Scripture. Christ takes on our sin. Christ becomes our sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. If we know that, then we can enter a world that is full of lost sinners, children of wrath, and we can do so full of hope because we know that Christ has borne the sin of his people. Christ has become the sin of his people so that when we go to them and we proclaim this gospel message, we can trust that their sin is covered if they are one of God's people. And if they turn to him in faith and repentance, there is salvation for them. So as Paul says there in verse 2 of chapter 6, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. So we should go to the world with hope. And that brings us to our second point, which is to look at three ingredients of the ministry of reconciliation. I think as we understand the way that Paul worked in the world, and of course, ultimately, the way that Christ himself 
worked in the world, we will be more equipped to go and carry out this ministry as well. So let's read verses 3 to 10 one more time in order to to see what Paul does here. He says, We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, speech, and the power of God. And with, or sorry, truthful, I skipped a whole line. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold, we live. As punished and yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. So the message is clear enough. Reconciliation by the substitutionary work of Christ. Again, we ask, how was that message proclaimed so effectively in the first few centuries so as to set up a thousand years of Christendom? Paul went to a world, Jesus, of course, went to a world that was utterly opposed to this message, and that world was converted. I think in this passage, Paul outlines at least three ingredients, three factors that, by God's grace, made his ministry so effective. The first ingredient is enduring trials with virtue. See that in uh, verses 4 to 6. I think it's very worth noting that as we look at this passage and we understand the context, of the the book of 2 Corinthians, that when Paul begins to explain why it is that that he should be trusted as an ambassador for Christ, before Paul ever uh, quotes numbers of conversions, before he ever recites, here's how many baptisms that I've, I've performed, or here's how many miles I've traveled in my ministerial work, or here's the amount of money I've raised for the church, The first thing that Paul points to to substantiate the fact that I really am an apostle of Christ is the struggles that he faced. If you know the context of 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul is, is writing this letter, at least in part, because there's a group of people who have sort of come about in the church and they're calling themselves or being called super apostles. And, uh, they, they're calling themselves this to contrast themselves with apostles like Paul. And, and what they're doing is they're going around and they're casting doubt on the ministry of Paul. And they're saying, ah, you know, I don't really know if Paul could be a real apostle because look at all these trials that he's going through. Is that a sign that God actually doesn't agree with him? You know, he's getting beaten up at almost every town he goes to. He's getting kicked out of all these different towns. He's getting shipwrecked. All these different things are happening to him. Maybe he's not really a trustworthy gospel preacher. So you should listen to us instead. So it's interesting that when Paul, in this letter to to demonstrate that he really is a minister of God and an apostle sent by Christ, he doesn't point to all these glorious things that perhaps he could, but instead he points to his sufferings. We hear what he endured. And not only do we hear what he endured, but we hear how he endured it. What is it that he endured? Afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. Those are the things that Paul went through in order to bring this message of reconciliation. But how did he endure those? What was the character of his endurance? By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love. I think that as Christians looking towards negative world. This is perhaps an atrophied muscle that we have to work on. I think that we have, for the most part, I know this is true for myself, we have found ourselves in a culture that broadly accepts Christian teaching, broadly accepts the Christian message, or at least won't openly hate you for preaching it. But I think that Aaron Wren is probably right in that that sort of culture is receding. I think that we are moving towards a sort of culture where simply being a Christian and saying generally Christian things 
will no longer gain you the approval of the world around you, but will instead gain you the disapproval of the world around you. And so this, this practice of enduring trials with our virtue is vitally important for us. It is a muscle that we, we have to begin to work out a little bit more because I think that we will need it. And I think as Christians, we have to understand that there actually is a difference between enduring trials and surviving trials. Those two things are not quite the same. I think that we can't really claim to have endured a trial if, while we're going through the trial, we lose all semblance of Christian virtue. We get really mad. We get vengeful. We start to hate in return. That's not endurance. That, that might be survival. You could say David. He survived the trial with Bathsheba, the temptation with Bathsheba. But I don't think we can say that he endured the temptation. You see, Peter, he survived the, the trial of, uh, of turning away from Jesus or rejecting Jesus three times on the night he was betrayed. He survived it, but he didn't endure that. I think all of us have our own experiences that are the same. Trials and temptations that, that we have faced and we've survived them. We came out the other side breathing, but we did not endure them. Endurance, I believe the endurance that we're called to as Christians, means maintaining our Christian virtue through the trial. See, first and foremost, before any eloquence or persuasive speech abilities, I think the most important aspect of gospel ministry in a negative world is, is this. Gospel perseverance, godly perseverance through trials especially the trials that are enforced upon us by the world, by unbelievers. There's a, a very fascinating document from the early church called the Letter to Diognetus. And uh, that document was written by a Christian who was explaining to a non-Christian. This non-Christian asked him the question. He said, why is it that even though we keep killing you, even though we keep taking you into the arena and feeding you to beasts and burning you at the stake and chopping your heads off, there are more of you now than there were when we started? This doesn't seem to make any sense. And in answer to that question, the author very clearly refers to the text that we're reading this morning. And he describes the Christians in this way. He says, they, the Christians, love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They lack everything, yet they overflow in everything. They are dishonored, and yet in their very dishonor, they are glorified. They are spoken ill of, and yet are justified. They are reviled, but bless. They are insulted, and repay the insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if raised from the dead. They are assailed by the Jews as barbarians. They are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet, this is interesting, those who hate them, are unable to give any reason for their hatred. That is the early church's explanation of, here's why we keep growing even though you keep killing us. It's all about how the Christians endured trials. It's all about the fact that they love in response to hate, that they, they show kindness in response to reviling. And I think that that would be probably Paul's first recommendation to us. If you are in a society where the world hates the message of Christ, then the most convincing thing you can do is to love them in response to their hatred, is to, to show them honor when they dishonor you, to show them kindness when they hate you. It was this virtue despite dishonor that made the early church so contagious, I think, because it makes utterly clear that they believe what they say. They do believe that there is a God who will receive them after they've been taken to the arena. Their, their life does not end when the blade falls, when the fire is kindled. That is not when the life of a Christian ends. That is when their eternal life begins. And this made the Christian message of the first few centuries so utterly contagious because it was a hope that was foreign to the world around them. The second ingredient I think Paul would point us to is in verse 7, which is proclaiming reconciliation with power. 
kind of picking up midway through a sentence here in verse 7, but we're transitioning here from first in, in the section we just looked at, how we sort of respond to what the world does to us. Here, Paul will begin to describe what we actively do, what we go out into the world with the purpose of doing. He says this, by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. There's a very famous saying that I, I agree with the heart of it, even though I think perhaps it can be often misapplied. Uh, it is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, and it's very famous, you've probably heard it, where, where he apparently said, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. I think we all get and agree with the heart of that, that our lives should, should show evidence of the God who, in whom we believe, of the Christ in whom we believe. Uh, that Hopefully that is true of all of us. I think that's really what Paul was describing in those uh, previous verses. But I think we must acknowledge, uh, properly speaking, the gospel cannot be proclaimed without words. And so, while we should certainly strive for the sort of life that is described by verses 4 to 6 that we just read, that life of virtuous endurance, I think we must also recognize, and what Paul hints at here in verse 7, is that simply living a life of virtuous endurance is not sufficient for turning negative world into positive world. There must be open gospel of reconciliation proclamation, and it must be done powerfully by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. Now, Paul, he has, he has told us in Ephesians about a weapon that we have as Christians, and that is the sword of the spirit. And he, he's kind of saying like, we are dual wielding the sword of the spirit in each hand. See, negative world cannot be dismantled, I think, unless we bring God's word to bear against every lofty argument that is exalted against the knowledge of God. That is part of the task that we've been assigned. We, we cannot only endure trials with virtue, but we must also proclaim the gospel of reconciliation. Paul uses this language of battle, weapons of righteousness. We must go into the world knowing that there is a battle taking place. There is a battle at hand. And if we act like it's peacetime, we will function very differently. But if we recognize that it is wartime in the spiritual sense, we will function, I think, how Paul is calling us to function. It reminds me of the scene from Lord of the Rings. Uh, Theoden is uh, hesitant to go to battle with Saruman. And he says, I would not risk open war. And Aragorn has to give him a little bit of a reality check. He says, open war is upon you whether you would risk it or not. You must recognize this as, as Christian. There is a war, it is a battle, not of flesh and blood, but of powers and principalities in the spiritual realm. But those powers and principalities uh, do have, uh, we might say, influence in this physical realm. We see it in myriad ways, that the, the forces of evil manifest in our world and they create great injustice. And if we want to see injustice end, then I think what we have to do is engage in the spiritual battle. Preach the gospel of reconciliation so that hearts would be changed, men would be changed, women would be changed, and justice would be done in the world. So we must proclaim the gospel of reconciliation with power. The third ingredient is to maintain an eternal perspective, to remember what God says to be eternally true and to uh, shun or to turn away from what the world says about us. And he gives multiple examples here. Verses 8 through 10. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, and yet we are true. As unknown, and yet well known. As dying, and behold, we live. As punished, and yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. Here what Paul does for us is he reminds us of the reality of who we are and what situation we are actually in. The world sees us as imposters, but God knows that we are true. The world sees us as unknown, and yet God knows us. The world sees us as dying, but we are recipients of eternal and abundant life. 
The world sees us as punished. But for all the world can do to us, they cannot truly kill us. The world sees us as sorrowful, and yet in Christ we are always rejoicing. The world sees us as poor, and yet we distribute riches, the riches of the gospel, beyond measure. And the world sees us as having nothing, and yet as co-heirs with Christ, we possess everything. That is the eternal perspective that we are called to maintain. To remember these truths about what God says and who God says we are, What God has given us, even though it may be invisible to the world around us, God sees it, and God's reality is the only true reality. And so the world may say all these things about us. It does not matter what they say. The world says we are unknown. The world says we are poor, but God says otherwise. So I think Paul's model of gospel ministry in negative world includes at least those three ingredients. Enduring trials with virtue, proclaiming the gospel message with power, and maintaining an eternal perspective. But Paul does go on, at least in the portion of the text we're going to continue to examine this morning, Paul does go on to give, I think, one other very important and maybe counterintuitive uh, command. It is a command for us we need to consider. So let's read from verse, chapter 6, verse 11, to chapter 7, verse 1. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So here's where we get to what I might refer to as the the attitude of the ambassador. This is our third point. The attitude of the ambassadors. This passage contains what might appear to be a contradiction. At least to modern ears, it might appear to be a contradiction or sound like one. In verse 13, Paul commands the Christians, the Corinthians... Widen your hearts. I think many modern readers would would hear something like that and and assume, well, this means to be more affirming, be more tolerant, widen your hearts and accept more people. But then for the next five verses, Paul goes on to strictly forbid partnership with the world, partnership with unbelievers. It's a very interesting sort of seeming juke that Paul throws in there. It's reminiscent of, of James's reminder in James 4.4. 4. You probably have heard this. James says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And I think it's fair when we approach a passage like this one that, that seems per, potentially to be very broad in its application. What does it mean to have no partnership with the world? How do we apply that? I think it's fair for us to to approach it and to ask, you know, what does Paul mean here? How far does this extend into my my relationships in the world? Where where does this apply and perhaps where does this not apply? And that that is a fair question to ask. I don't want to poo-poo that question. But what I do want is for us not to approach a passage like this with the same heart as the man who came to Jesus and, and asked, well, who is my neighbor? What was his was his heart behind that question? Well, he wanted to minimize the command of Christ down to something more manageable. I think that we can approach a text like this that sounds very exclusive, and we can say, that sounds kind of tough to apply. You know, who am I really not supposed to have partnership with? I think really, if we understand the general context of Scripture as one giant story, the, the message of this passage is clear. Partnership between God's people and the people of the world, the unbelieving world, 
as almost without exception throughout the entire history of God's people, always produced compromise. When God's people have sought to work with the people of the world, to partner with the people of the world, it has almost always produced compromise amongst God's people. Remember Solomon, apparently the wisest man who ever lived, but with many wives. And what does it say at the end of Solomon's story? His many wives turned his heart astray. If we recognize that we perhaps are not as wise as Solomon, then I think we must also recognize that we need to limit our partnership with the world. There's a a phrase that I really love by a, a Christian sociologist named Peter Berger, and he describes the Christian attitude as against the world, for the world. We must recognize as Christians that we are called to oppose the world we are called to oppose the world, not because we laugh at them and we, we scoff at them and we desire their condemnation. We oppose them because they are marching to destruction and we want to turn them around. We want to oppose them for their own good. We are against the world, you might say, for the sake of the world. We oppose the world for the good of the world. And we do so because we know God has such great promises for all those who turn to him in faith and repentance. Some of the promises mentioned just in this passage, I will be their God and they will be my people. I will be their father and they will be my sons and daughters. This is God's promise of reconciliation. And so as we look to the world, we don't don't look and say, I oppose you because I hate you. We say, I oppose you because you are running in the direction of destruction, and I want you to be a son and a daughter of God. And so we must remember Paul's final admonition there in chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Purify yourselves so that you can rightly approach the world with the ministry of reconciliation. Remember God's promises. I think that we are entering a world more like Paul's than that of our parents or grandparents. We are in a battle. And unless we love our enemies and wield the weapons of righteousness in each hand, we have no hope of turning negative world back into positive world. And so we are called to suffer virtuously, return love for hate, endure with purity and patience. Speak truth boldly. Separate yourself from the unbelieving ways of the world. Cleanse yourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. Though the world says that you are unknown, you are known by God. You are seen by him and you will be rewarded by him. Trust in him. Father, we know that this task is beyond us. We have great wisdom from your word about how to do it, but we know that apart from your spirit working, it is hopeless. There is great hope because the one who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. You have given us great promises that you will be our God and we will be your people, that we will be your sons and daughters and you will be our father. These are the promises that we go to the world to remind them of, to show them, to proclaim to them. This is the good news of reconciliation, not the bad news of condemnation. So I pray that you would make us bold in that proclamation, that you would purify us so that we can proclaim this from a clean conscience, and that we would honor you in every thought, word, and deed as we go out this week. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our precious Savior. Amen.